Okay, so I just finished recording a rant review for a book I didn't like, so I'm just so happy to be here now to talk to you guys about Arabasta. So I think it's Arabasta. I'm gonna be saying Arabasta throughout this video. So I actually already recorded the beginning of this review and then I had to stop because I had to go pick up my kid from school, so I'm back. But I want to talk about this is gonna be another long video, so for anybody who's not gonna stick around for the entire video, I wanna insert this at the beginning where I just talk about how unbelievably brilliant <laughs> this saga is. It has blown me away. I mean, I have so much love for this saga, especially, especially the final arc. Okay, let's talk. So what I think is brilliant is the entire first saga was really great setup. It was helping us to get to know Luffy, slowly getting to know the crew, collecting our people, at least this part of the crew that we'll have for a little bit. But then at the very end of the saga in Arlong Park, we really get a taste for, or we get, we get our first really good experience with what this series truly is capable of. And that's incredibly deep topics discussed, real, emotions and pain that our characters go through and the extent that Luffy will go through go to to protect his people. We really get to see the depth and emotion that this story brings as well as the fun, the lightheartedness, the gags. It Arlong Park really is the beginning of showing us what One Piece can be, right? And then that saga ends, and now we have the next saga. So now that we've done our ground laying, now that we've done our establishing, now in our next saga, Oda is supposed to show us what the series can be. And I just think that Arabasta is such a good follow-up. It's such a good, and here's, and here's what it is, right? So I think the first saga was, here's what you're in for, and then the second saga is, and here's what it is. And it, it delivers. It delivers on so many levels. These amazing character moments, they stay. These incredible emotional highs and lows, they stay. These brutally honest looks into really hard times and really hard things that happen in our world, they stay. Oda doesn't hold back on he doesn't keep things surface level. He doesn't, he doesn't hold back on really showing us a mirror of our world and digging deep into it. And man, it's just good. It's just good. And how does Oda choose to put what this series is on display? How does Oda choose to do it? By the crew fighting for someone else by the crew absolutely doing a side quest. They're not even after their own dreams in this saga. They're after just helping someone that they love. And if that isn't an accurate depiction of this crew, I don't know what is. I think it's brilliant that, that in this saga where Oda is supposed to be showing off what this series is, the first saga was set up, now here's the series. What is it? It's them fighting for someone else. It's them sacrificing for someone else. It's them nearly dying for someone else, for someone else's dreams, just because they care about her. I love it. I love it so much. We're introduced to this just massive dump of, of new people. And I think that really threw me off the first time around because especially with Baroque Works, uh, this crew of new, this, this massive organization of new people that I'm supposed to be understanding their inner workings and I'm supposed to be invested in these people and they're all these villains. And it was just a lot to take in when I've just accumulated all these new people. And now on top of that, here's a barrage of new villains as well. Um, but you gotta beef up your crew if we're gonna have a war. And I'm so inarticulate when talking about this saga because this saga blows me away so much. Crocodile, incredible villain. Incredible, incredible villain. Not only because he's He's smart. He's so smart. He's able, he's able to orchestrate this war without his face ever being known by his own people. Uh, he's able to turn 
an entire king, not an entire kingdom. He's able to turn so much of a kingdom against its king by lying about him, by, uh, by setting him up, and then orchestrating this war where they're fighting each other. They're fighting each other. He turned a nation against itself. He turned a country, a kingdom, against itself. Not only that, but the climax of the war. Wow, there's so much more. Oh, there's so much. Okay. Crocodile is the first villain that we face that we get to be scared. He's the first villain that we face that defeats Luffy twice. And it's really his own arrogance is the only reason that he doesn't finish the job. It's it's him seeing Luffy as as just a, a, a little pup that, that yips real loud, that thinks he's going to be the Pirate King, that has a lot of dreams, but he's going to be wiped out by the ocean, uh, by, by the seas. He's going to be wiped out by the reality of what he's going to face. Um, oh, I wish I could really just break that one down. But he is stronger than Luffy. He is, he, he does take Luffy down and could have killed him quite easily if he would have just, you know, checked his pride a little bit. Not only that though, the rest of our character have to really, uh, the rest of our characters, the rest of our crews have to really step it up as well. Then we have so many new characters being introduced that end up packing the same punches. Vivi is an extraordinary character, absolutely extraordinary, and I will go into her because I love and adore her and the role that she plays in this saga. But then, when we get to the final, final fight between Luffy and Croc, the third fight, and the way that, uh, the way everything comes together, when the rain falls, with Luffy, I mean, with, with Vivi screaming, like, just I'll talk about it all. I'm gonna talk about it all. But for anybody that's gonna click off of this video before I, you know, it's gonna be another long one. I just wanna be sure, I just wanna be sure to say that this saga blew me away. I, it was so, it was so well done. It was so well done. This is supposed to be the next step, right? Like this is supposed to be, and not only that, but the way the world was expanded, you know? We went from island to island to island, but in, in Arabasta Saga, the world got so much bigger and we learned so much more about what we're doing here and what this journey is gonna look like and and how vast this world is and the, the mechanics of what we're gonna have to navigate. The world got bigger, the story got bigger, the cast got bigger, but still, I I have hope that Vivi will come back into our story and she will win my heart even more. I don't know. Okay, sorry. This is a mess. I just want to take the time to say that we made the world bigger. We faced off against a villain that is so evil, so unflinchingly selfish and cruel and mean and truly a match for our crew. Uh, we, we met a hero. Vivi is such a hero for her kingdom. Someone that is so inspiring, as well as so many little characters that, that invoke that same amount of awe in me. And, and, and a battle that just blows me away the way Oda orchestrated this war and then brought it to an end. I'm just blown away by it. Okay, sorry. I, I, I can't, I can't really express well, I can't put into words how incredible I think this saga was and all the reasons why, but I wanted to attempt it at the beginning of the video for anyone that isn't going to hang out with me for the full, I'm sure, hour that we'll be here. So, like I said, I've already recorded the first bit, but just a reminder that uh, I'm only hitting on major plot points here. I'm Well, not plot points. I'm, as this is a re-review and as I'm doing an entire saga in one video, I'm not trying to hit on every single moment. I'm not trying to touch on every single thing. I'm just hanging out with you guys and chatting about the moments that impacted me the hardest, the moments that I thought were the biggest. And unfortunately, we're talking about One Piece, which means that there were a lot of them. <laughs> there were a lot of moments that hit me the hardest. So we'll be here for a minute.
thanks for hanging out with me for so long, diving into what I recorded a few days ago. Starting with, of course, Reverse Mountain, which is the first arc. Man, it feels good to see Nami in her, in her element. After everything that we just went through with her in Arlong Park, now seeing her as a part of the crew, uh, just understanding the weather, reading maps, really showing how much of an asset she is to this crew, how intelligent she is, and seeing her in her element, not only uh, seeing her being able to do all these things, but seeing her free and doing them, finally doing them for herself, for her own dreams and her own adventures. So satisfying. Seeing Laboon again really, really hit hard. I mean, Laboon, see, seeing Laboon the first time, the first time I read this, hit hard back then. This entire story of this whale that is hurting himself, nearly killing himself, and when we find out that it's because when he was a baby his crew left him behind and he's still waiting for them and refusing to hear that they abandon him, knowing that they will come back trying to get to them. Man, that's rough. That's, that's rough stuff. But now that I know his crew, or at least one of the members of his crew, now that I know the backstory, now that I realize what happened and I have the context of Brooke and what Brooke and his crew went through and that they're just all trying to get to each other, that hurts. That hurts. It's amazing how much, not just ground laying Oda lays in this story, not just how much he set up for us to have paid off, years later in time of people reading week to week and in time of him writing it, how much foresight this man had for a series, how much planning he must have put into it, and the fact that he put this planning in back here and he couldn't make the payoff until years and years in the future and that it still landed so hard, that's incredible. Not only all that, but then when I get to go back and read it again with the new context, the layers that that new context adds to the story is unbelievable. Truly, that level of skill blows me away. Seeing Miss Wednesday and Mr. Nine, was it? Show up and try to harm Laboon really isn't the best introduction for Vivi. And it does make me wonder because they're attempting to do this as a cover for this organization because they're trying to get to Crocodile because they're trying to save their people. It does make me wonder what kind of things they did other than attempting to kill our sweet baby wonderful Laboon. What other things did they try to do for the sake of keeping their cover at this organization? I really do wonder. And of course, seeing Luffy punch Laboon in the eye and, and chuck the thing, the sail mass in Laboon's uh, injury and all the ways in which he harmed him. How dare you, sir? How freaking dare you? I was so, I don't know. Again, my memory is terrible. I have a horrible memory and having read the beginning of this series in a more casual way and not in such an inten intentional trying to soak in every detail sort of way because I didn't realize the impact that the story would have on me. Going back, I've forgotten so many things and seeing Luffy attack Laboon, I was like, what are you doing? Am I about to turn on my favorite character in the series? Am I truly about to start hating this man because how could you hurt Laboon? But doing it to give Laboon something to live for, painting a really bad version of their pirates, their sail, their symbol on Laboon's injuries and telling him, you can't be smashing against the wall anymore. You can't be doing this anymore because we have to have this mark because we're gonna fight again someday. Giving Laboon something to live for, it's just, it just, it follows the theme of Luffy so much where he's such an instinctual person. He's such a, I act in the way that feels right to me, respond in the way that instinctually fits to what I'm feeling in the moment, regardless of all the details around me. Seeing the truth behind a situation and then doing what he can to help them. Even if it's in a way that at first looks odd, at first looks messy, at first looks harmful, and then you realize that man, that, that man is all heart. And I also love the level of respect and trust that the crew has for him, where they see him doing something crazy and they might respond or react, but they don't move. 
they stay still, they don't try to interfere because they trust their captain. And sometimes one of them thinks they need to react and somebody holds them back and they say, wait, because they, they trust their captain's instincts. He is a captain of instincts, but when he moves, it's either really stupid or it's really, really, really powerful. And man, it's great. I do plan on making a whole video really chatting about Laboon and Brooke and all of this eventually um, because I think it speaks to us all, you know? This, this story is so heartbreaking and I just, I wanna see it. I wanna see Brooke and Laboon come back together, please. Oh, also, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, Kratos? The guy who stayed behind to look after Laboon while Brooke and crew sailed off. He was part of Roger's crew? He knows Roger? <laughs> what is the, what is happening here? What does that mean? What does that imply? What does it mean? Who are you, sir? Um, there's so many little moments that I love too. I love when they're on the ship and they're facing terrible weather conditions, creatures, they're, they've, they've fought for the ship and fought to stay alive for a good chunk of time. And now they're all exhausted, passed out on the deck and Zoro slept through everything. And then he wakes up and his first response is, hey, I know it's a beautiful day, but shouldn't you guys be working? How dare you, sir? And then when Zoro realizes that they're taking Miss Wednesday and Mr. Nine home, uh, and Zoro says, you realize we don't owe them anything, which my goodness, do they not? And Luffy's response is just, no, we don't, but we are. It's so good. Oh, also when Zoro actually uh, sees them and he recognizes them from when they were, when he was, when this organization, um, Baroque Works was trying to recruit Zoro. And, and so Zoro recognizes them and he's like, oh, you look familiar. And he's, he's intentionally making them sweat, but he's not revealing that he knows of them. Oh, that's so good. That's just such a good moment. Uh, then later, whenever he has to face off against the organization and he, he reveals that he knows who they are, what they're about, because they tried to recruit him and they all want to attack him. So he just disappears and then appears in the crowd in the middle of all of them. Like, hey, want to fight? Oh. It's so good. Um, I, it's so funny to see the contrast of Nami in such a short period of time, you know, like we saw her in Arlong Park. And yes, before Arlong Park, we saw her being greedy and selfish. She abandoned the entire crew and uh, stole their ship and their treasure for her own agenda, but they're pirates. And that's her one rule. She can steal from pirates because she's trying to do, free an entire town. But we got to know in our long park how incredibly selfish she's been for eight years. For eight years, she has worked for the people who killed her own mother and who enslaved her and her entire town growing up. Um, she's working for them to free them. She's been working so hard and doing so much for the sake of everyone else. And now that she's free and her people are free, and now that she's able to uh, sail with her crew, I don't know, the, the, the big contrast of her now just being totally selfish at times and completely treasure-minded, it's odd, but I'm really happy for her. I'm happy for her that now for the first time in a long time, she just, she gets to think about herself a little bit. She gets to be a little bit selfish. She gets to go on adventures and, and steal treasure and do what she wants for her. And I just feel like she's earned it. And also with this, you get hilarious little moments, like when she's manipulating Zoro into, she, she bargains a deal with this guy and then manipulates Zoro into being her muscle. Yeah, and then we and then we follow that with uh, the big Zoro and Luffy fight, which I love when Luffy shows up. I love Zoro's response of, "Oh hey, like it's such a it's such a cheerful, friendly, kind. Oh hey, you probably don't want to get involved in this, or do you owe Nami money too? Like it's just it's so adorable, it's so cute. And no, I don't I, do, I don't like this fight. I mean, it's awesome to watch. I, I haven't seen it in the anime, but it's awesome to read, to see happen. It's a great fight. These two are two really powerful men and they it's it's a really great fight. But 
I don't like it. I don't think it fits. I just don't think it fits with Luffy's character to completely turn on Zoro in this way. Now, don't get me wrong. I do understand that for Luffy, these people fed him and to Luffy, you get you feed me equals you good person, right? So I understand that they fed him. Now they have his loyalty. He loves them. And the scene that he walked up on does look really bad. It looks really, really bad. But I still don't really buy it. It feels really out of character for Luffy because I just don't think that this one person saying it was Zoro would be enough for Luffy to completely turn on his friend. Like he even says in the fight that he wants to kill Zoro. And maybe I misinterpreted it, misinterpreted it in him saying, die Zoro or whatever it is that he says. Maybe he was saying it happily, like it's all a joke to him, but it didn't come off that way to me. I mean, in Arlong Park, Nami supposedly killed Usopp and Zoro watched it happen. It's confirmed, Nami killed Usopp. And Luffy doesn't believe it. He's like, no, she wouldn't do that. And he doesn't turn on Nami, even though she turned on one of his crew. He believes her, he trusts her. And he doesn't offer Zoro the same. The scene he walked up on looks bad and he was fed by these people. So he loves them and trusts them, but he loves and trusts Zoro too. He's his crewmate. He's the first crewmate he collected. And believing this one guy saying it was Zoro, and then just like not even needing to ask questions, not even allowing Zoro to explain himself, just showing up ready to kill his comrade. I don't know. I don't believe it. It was a great fight, but the way in which we got to the fight, I don't, I don't think Luffy would turn on his crewmate that quickly, that easily, and not even let them explain. And I can't think of another instance so far in the series that I've read up to this point, I can't think of another instance where he turns on a crewmate so quickly based off of one person's word. Like, I can't think of an equivalent to this. So it feels like a one-off thing, and I just, it doesn't seem to fit with his character. I know I'll get pushback on that, but that is how I feel. Oh my goodness, when Vivi reveals who Crocodile is, who Mr. Zero is, I love their reactions. Just this one panel of them all reacting with Nami having a reasonable reaction of, oh my goodness, like I realize what kind of situation I'm in now. Luffy being excited, <laughs> and then Zoro not really reacting at all and just being like, you just told us, even though you said you wouldn't. It's just, it's actually this entire saga, the way people reacted to things was something that stood out to me so much because I think just the way a character reacts to something, again, I haven't really read that much manga. I'm still very inexperienced in this format. So I can't really say how manga is as a whole, but I'll speak to Oda. The way Oda makes his characters react to situations, I think adds so much subtext to who the characters are so well. And this entire saga, there's so many things that happen to these characters and the way that they react to all of these things is brilliant. And I really love how often, uh, not in this scene, but all throughout the saga, how often Luffy and Usopp react in exactly the same manner and the rest of the crew is just over here reacting in a completely different way. And it's great because we just collected Usopp not that long ago and seeing how similar, even though they're very different people in the way they, re in the way they, they view the world and the amount of fear slash, um, uh, assertiveness that they have. They're so different in so many ways, yet you just see the the connection of their friendship in the way they're dazzled by things or just so, just, it's it's beautiful. But really, I think the best part about this arc, the, the biggest part about this arc is Luffy's arc with Vivi's friend. We have their introduction where Luffy just very bluntly and rudely uh, just tells him, I don't like your hair. Why'd you do this? Then Luffy doesn't seem to care about him at all in any way throughout this entire arc until he decides to dress as Vivi to be a decoy. And suddenly Luffy's all about him because he looks great. Even interrupts him to remind him again, really, you look great. And then when he's killed, Luffy turns because he liked that guy. And why does he not like Robin? Because she killed the guy he liked. And just that, that arc from 
insulting him, insulting his hair the moment he meets him to complete indifference to such an extreme change just because he dressed like Vivi and Luffy was really into it. And then like that, that level of dedication and fierce anger towards Robin because she killed the guy that looked cool for a minute. That's just, that's just, I love that. I love that. That's hilarious to me. Okay, I'm gonna have to do that thing again where I'll have to come back later to finish discussing this because I need to go pick my kid up from school. So, enter future Murphy. Okay, back to present timeline Murphy. So now we're gonna talk about Little Garden. I love Little Garden. So, Little Garden, I think probably of all the islands that we've visited, it's, if not, if it's not my favorite, it's one of my favorites. I mean, caves to explore, volcanoes exploring sporadically, dinosaurs, uh, the, this entire island that doesn't age at the rate that we would expect. It's kind of like a time capsule, amazing, wonderful giants that I want to befriend myself, even though they don't belong here, but that's okay. I mean, sure, basically every human that visits Little Garden dies, but I love it and I, would, I wouldn't mind visiting here. Maybe not for 10 years. Is that how long he said it takes for the log post to reset? Anyway, we're talking about major moments. Let's go. I love that. I love I love the the two giants. Um, their their plight, their fight. They don't even remember what they're fighting over, but they trust that their god will favor whoever is supposed to be the winner of this fight that they're having. They trust that the volcano signifies that that's when they need to start fighting again. And whenever uh, whenever somebody wins, it will be the 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 decla declaration of their god. I love their camaraderie and their genuine love for each other. I love that Luffy and Usopp just get them. They don't need much explanation. They don't need to observe it for very long. They get them and therefore they connect to them and therefore they are invested. And that is very much a theme <laughs> throughout all of One Piece of the crew taking someone on and taking someone else's dreams and burdens on of their, for their own and, and launching themselves into defending who they deem deserving of their defense. But I do, I love the relationship between these two giants. I love how much they enjoy the fight and how much joy they bring to it, how much they love each other, despite not even remembering what they're fighting about. Um, and, and the way the one giant, I'm sorry, I don't remember their names already, um, really was so devastated when he realized that he unwillingly took part in taking advantage of of the fight when his, that he took advantage of his friend being harmed even though he didn't know it. I don't know. I love them. So as a lot of you guys already know, I have a terrible memory, genuinely awful. And when I was first reading One Piece, I went in knowing nothing about it. I wasn't expecting everything to connect. I wasn't expecting to need to soak in every single detail because it would all come back around, which I absolutely love that that's what the series is. But a lot of the villains that we faced in the early sagas, I expected to just be, you know, one-off villains. We're facing this guy now, then we're facing that guy, now we're facing this person. I didn't expect it all to matter, and so I'm not, I'm not committing these people to memory whatsoever. At least I wasn't in the first read-through. So, I have forgotten a lot about these early villains. Mr. Three being one of them. Now I know, it's, it's, it's actually, it's really interesting. People like Crocodile and Mr. Three and uh, Bon Clay. So many of the villains that I know through Impel Down because I barely remembered them when I got to Impel Down. And now I'm seeing them in the beginning and I'm recontextualizing them against how I know them at Impel Down. It's such a backwards way to read things, but I actually have been loving reading it this way because it just fits. It all fits. Mr. Three is dark. He is excited to see people's despair. He's thrilled to kill people. He's so excited to kill them in the most, um, 
humiliating and like he what's agony is the look I seek let your bodies become monuments to horror that's dark stuff mr. three I mean he's not a good guy but then I compare him to how I know him in impel down and it's consistent I love that in impel down he helps our crew he teams up with our crew so far as it benefits him much like buggy I actually love the relationship between mr. three and buggy but anyway so much that so far as it helps him, but he happily abandons them. He happily uh, will leave people behind. He doesn't actually care about anyone. He maintains being dark, not to the same extent because he's weaker at that point uh, or more encumbered. But I I like that each of these characters, as I'm as I'm re meeting them in their beginning, they're so consistent still from how I knew them. In impel down this scene here where mr. three is uh, freezing waxifying our crew uh, parts of our crew and you know he's gonna kill him um, as well as one of the Giants I I love this scene for a lot of reasons it's obviously hilarious the whole situation of Zorro being willing to cut off his own legs and I, I also I love how that maintains that we continue to see his tattered pants anytime we see the lower half of his body just so good anyway Zoro being willing to cut off his own legs, and when they question him, what are you gonna do when you cut off your legs, Zoro? And he's like, I'm gonna defend you. I'll figure it out at when the time comes. Uh, and then whenever he realizes, oh no, we're all gonna be frozen here by the wax. Okay, and then he strikes a pose because he wants to be, he wants to make sure that the pose he he's frozen forever and killed in is at least a cool one. There's so much humor wrapped up in this scene, but I, I love the scene for that humor, but I also love the scene for what Zoro does here. Zoro had just met this giant. Uh, I think I think he he sees him, says, wow, you must have eaten all your vegetables. And then now we're in this position of near death, right? So he just met the giant. And now they're in this position where they're being waxified. And Zoro, this is where Zoro's at his best. When there's chaos happening around him and when there's imminent threats and Zoro just stops and calmly assesses the situation. What's happening here? Who's around me? And how are they reacting? And then he thinks about it, he considers, and, he, and, and it just clicks for him. He just understands, okay, here's what we need to do next. We see this all the time when Luffy makes a plan or when Nami makes a plan, when when Usopp, we see this all the time when somebody makes a plan and Zoro says, oh, got it. And he responds with them. He has this ability to assess a situation, to see what's happening and who he's with and to understand what needs to happen next. We see it all the time with him. But this is a great display of that where he doesn't even know this giant and he doesn't understand this threat that they're up against. He literally just walked up into this scene and he calmly assesses the situation and then turns to the giant. He reminds our giant that the situation isn't over, that he can still fight, even encourages him not having an arm anymore is going to be better than just laying down and fighting. And then he offers to cut his own legs off with him. He, he encourages the giant, keep fighting. Even if this handicaps you, keep fighting. The fight isn't over. Watch. I'll chop my own legs off with you and we'll fight together. And it was that solidarity and that encouragement that motivated the giant to keep fighting. I do think that Zoro was serious in that moment. I do think that he was gonna cut off his legs and he was just gonna figure it out from there. But there's just something very impactful about Zoro's calm assessments in moments of terror and his ability to understand the moment and understand the people that he's with and understand what the best next move is and go and and go along with people to follow whatever plan Luffy's concocted but hasn't communicated but Zoro gets it to understand that he he needs to hype up this this giant and stand next to him and say we'll do this together there's something really really significant about that role that Zoro plays that is I think very easily overlooked I mean I'm not saying that the fandom overlooks it I don't think this fandom overlooks anything but 
it really stood out to me here. I also just love this moment of Luffy where uh, Mr. Three, when Luffy shows up on the scene. Oh, that's another funny thing about it. When Luffy shows up on the scene and he's like, are you guys in trouble? And Zoro goes, no, not really. And he's literally hacked his legs half off. Anyway, so Luffy shows up in the scene. He doesn't know what's going on, but he's ready to fight because he's Luffy. And Mr. Three tries to solidify, tries to waxify Luffy's legs. And Luffy's response is, oh, perfect. And he uses it as a weapon. As if Luffy was looking for this the whole time. As if Luffy anticipated this. No, it's just every obstacle he faces, this is Luffy. This is, he, cre he finds a creative way around things and a creative way to use himself and anything around him as a weapon to help him get out of danger. I love her pink girl um, who is teamed up with Mr. Three. I love her whole attitude. I love her laziness and her ambivalence of everything that's happening to her. She really just wants to sit down and have a picnic. But whenever she is going to fight, she's a force to be reckoned with. Um, I think that her color abilities are very interesting. I understand that it's not a devil fruit. That's made very clear in, in the in the thing as it's said that it's hypnotism. But I do wonder about this actually. This is quite confusing to me because if her powers are, she's using colors and hypnotism, which is fun, I really like it. But if it's hypnotism, then why can she hit Luffy in the back with a color? and he doesn't even know he's been hit, and he doesn't even see the color, but it affects him. I don't really understand that connection with hypnotism and the way it's used, but I don't care because I love her powers and it's a delight to watch her fight. Usopp is again making plans and executing them. I love that Usopp is not a strong fighter, that he's not a contender in any fight, but he's constantly outthinking his opponents. And I love the role he plays in that. And also this whole scene at the end uh, where Luffy and Mr. Three are facing off. First of all, Mr. Three's summation, summation of Luffy is exactly on point. We're the best brains of Baroque works, and you're just a powerful oaf who acts only on instinct. That's exactly what Luffy is. How did you pin him so well? How did you, how did you figure him out so quickly? But then when Luffy just, you know, Mr. Three's talking all this, all this talk, and Luffy just picks him out of the crowd, and he does it on instinct. I, I love that Mr. Three assesses Luffy's weakness and mocks it, and then Luffy uses it as his strength. It's perfect. Sanji didn't really play a role in this arc, unfortunately. In fact, he didn't really play a role in this saga until the very end, and in the end, he was amazing. Uh, but I did like the scene where he was on the phone with Crocodile. It was pretty funny. Oh, I also will will make note. It's a, it's such a small thing. I said I'll only talk about big moments. I'm a liar. I really I really like this uh, page where we can see that Sanji gave Nami his jacket. I just think that's cute. Anyway, it's also a great send-off when the giants tell the crew to sail straight ahead and Luffy unflinchingly trusts them and then we see Usopp's first lie come true. At least I think it's the first one. It's the first one I've noticed. I've been looking for this. I really like that trope uh, where... Is it a trope? I think it's a trope. I think it's fair to call it a trope where a character says things, uh, whether it be prophecies or in this case, lies, and then you get to watch those prophecies and try to try to find them where they come true, where they unfold. It happens in uh, Malazan, <laughs> it happens in Wheel of Time, it happens in a lot of fantasy stories where you get prophecies that are really abstract and strange, but then on reread, you get to see them actually come into, flu into fr fruition. I, I really like that. It's fun. Anyway, I'm enjoying looking out for Usopp's lies in this reread. Actually, I do also want to mention, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I do also want to mention something that really stood out to me in this arc that, again, I just think is brilliant. Here's the thing. Oda's not that heavy-handed of a writer. He's not one of those authors that is really smart, makes a ton of connections, makes a ton of parallels, and then just like forces your face in it and says, hey, do you see how smart I am? Do you see these things I did? I'm clever, aren't I? I hate that. And he's not one of those authors. He's one of those authors that's just brilliant in the way he make, creates these parallels absolutely everywhere. I mean, his story is dripping with parallels and he doesn't, he doesn't do it forcefully. He's just like, he just drops them in there and he lets the reader find them to the extent that they will find them. 
And I just, I just, I just adore it. So anyway, little garden. I love the parallel of the giants and Zoro and, and Sanji. I mean, Zoro and Sanji are adorable throughout this entire arc with their little bargain of, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna catch the biggest game. No, I'm gonna catch the biggest game. And then they both do it so easily. Both of them, the moment they face off against a freaking dinosaur, which kills every human that comes on, I mean, every human that comes on this island can't survive it. And Sanji and Zoro both just wander into the woods alone, and when they meet dinosaurs, they're just like, easily tame them or kill them and or. So anyway, they both handle themselves quite well. And then in the end, they're fighting over whose game is bigger, and then we get to see the real reason why the giants were fighting all along. And it's the same reason. And I just think that's adorable, and I would also like to make note that the giants may bicker, may fight, but they have a deep, deep, deep friend, friendship, and loyalty with each other. And I just know that my boys do too. Okay, I think we're now in Drum Island. So I, again, love and adore Nami. She is the best. So we're at sea. We need to move forward. We need to get to Arabasta because uh, Vivi's kingdom is at war and will destroy itself soon. Um, and Nami doesn't want the crew to worry about her. She's sick, she is dying, and she is sacrificing her health for Vivi and for Vivi's kingdom. And I love and adore this because I love this selflessness from undoubtedly our most selfish crew member, but she deserves to be the most selfish crew member because of everything that she's given up over these last eight years. It doesn't matter. So I love her selfish selflessness, but then I also love Vivi's response of sacrificing or putting on hold her dreams, potentially hurting her kingdom for the sake of taking a detour for Nami. And then, and then the crew's reaction when Vivi made that choice. I just, oh man. Drum Island is a delight. It's a very interesting um, island and, and group of people and conundrum that they're in. Uh, I love this ongoing bit of Luffy not feeling the cold. Um, I love this moment where Luffy once again just wants to fight his way forward, just wants to blast his way past any obstacle. And Vivi insults him and humbles him, and he humbles himself, and he really listens to her. He really learns from her. And I love that moment. I love that, I love that Luffy is so teachable. He's, he's silly, he acts on instinct, he isn't the most intelligent character in the series, but he will listen to the people that he lets influence him. And I love it. I love this whole quest of taking Nami up the mountain because once again, we're gonna talk about teachability. Um, not only is it hilarious when they're going up the mountain and again, um, Luffy and Sanji are just so seamlessly dodging these terrible threats that should take them down so easily, but our, our guys are powerful. And so they're just having a nice little chit chat about nothing in particular while they're dodging these terrible foes. But also, back to Luffy's teachability, Sanji is adamant that you have to be careful. You can't be your typical rush into danger, fight with all your might. You know, you can't be Luffy today. Today, you have to be Nami's protector because she will die if you're not careful. And Luffy really has to restrain himself, much like he did when they first got to Drum Island and he wanted to fight his way forward and he chose to bow instead. Now, too, he wants to be the fighter. He wants to be the one that fights their way up the mountain. He wants to be the one that gets the glory. But instead, he's forced to restrain himself and he's forced to be Nami's protector instead. He displays so much teachability. Even after Sanji's knocked out and Luffy is, is carrying both Sanji and Vivi, he faces opponents and even though Sanji's not there to tell him once again to be careful, he remembers Sanji's counsel and he takes it. And I love that. Also just the scene of, of Luffy carrying both Vivi and Sanji up the mountain and his hands are bleeding and he's screaming. And then once he gets to the top, 
he passes out, but right before he passes out, he just begs for Dr. Lady to save his friends. Man, that's a good scene. Also Chopper, while I love, I do, I do like Chopper, you guys, but he's not my top straw hat. Um, nor is he in the top list. I do like him, but he doesn't move me like so many other characters do. I hope, I hope that changes. I do, because I know you guys love him. But I will say that on this reread, Chopper's entrance is so strong, so strong. I mean, this entire, this is his entrance arc, and it's a great arc. But just when we first see him and he saves them, that's a great panel. That is good stuff. But then you've got Chopper's entire backstory with him, you know, being rejected and mocked. Um, I, I do like that we're just constantly hit with a bunch of little fables and fairy tales throughout this. You know, Chopper is obviously Rudolph being called names and made fun of because of his funny nose. It's cute. Um, but anyway, uh, him being completely rejected by his own people, and then he goes to seek refuge amongst humans, and he's mocked and rejected and called a monster by them. His backstory of being rejected by both halves of him, you know, he is fully reindeer, but he's also human. That's two halves of who he is. And he seeks acceptance among both halves of who he is and both halves of them consider him to be too odd, too other, and they reject him and they mock him and they call him names. And that, that rejection, that level of pain. You know, I, once again, there's so many things throughout the series that just, I just think readers can really latch onto and relate to and know, know the feeling. <laughs> um, then Chopper finally finds someone that accepts him and loves him and embraces him and takes him in. And his level of loyalty, his level of so desperately wanting to save him, so desperately wanting to keep him alive when he's dying, um, you know, his love for Chopper as well. And then of course his speech, uh, when a man when a man truly dies. Uh, there's so much about Chopper, Choppers, there's so much about Chopper's introduction that, really just it packs a punch. It really hits hard. And Chopper's a wonderful character, um, and it's a great introduction for him. I'll also, also note, <laughs> I really love how the crew embraces him. I love that both Sanji and Luffy want to eat Chopper the moment they see him. They see him and they see meat, uh, and and they're and they're they're chasing after him, ready ready to eat him. And then the moment they realize that he has cool abilities, they switch from aggressively chasing him to kill him and eat him to aggressively chasing him to force him into their crew. And I think it's adorable. I also think it's really sweet the moment where uh, Luffy does something, I don't remember what, and Sanji uh, turns to Chopper and says, yeah, he's basically a monster. And seeing that term being used in a loving and accepting way of like, we're all weirdos here and we're family. And Chopper seeing that word being used in that way, when it's only been used as as uh, as an insult, as something to tear him down. It's just good stuff. Um, I guess I really, <laughs> I really need to just be hitting on, on major moments, not the little moments. So I'm just gonna also mention this moment with Luffy and the flag. That was, that was a really good moment. And Chopper's exit and goodbye were really, really good too. Okay, okay, that's all I'm gonna do for Drum Island because I have not a lot of time before I need to go pick my kid up from school. I will mention this, I love seeing Ace again. I love, uh, I love this little, little time that we get with him and the crew. It's adorable. Um, I'll also mention really quick, well, okay. So a few things, I guess. I, with these re-reviews, my goal is to be talking about the major moments, right? The, the big things that stood out to me that really meant a lot to me. And I'm really focusing on character and story and not like the little details that are planted throughout. So in my last re-review, quite a few people were concerned that I missed certain things like um, 
the mention of Jim Bay that he uh, that he gave permission to the Arlong pirates to do whatever while he was a warlord and therefore his permission affected all the things that happened with Nami in her town and all that. I, I just want to assure you that I did see the mention of Jim Bay. I do desperately want more information when we move forward with the story and when I get to spend more time with Jim Bay. I want him to explain himself. I want to know why he gave Arlong that kind of freedom, you know, what what was the reasoning of that? Um, so, you know, stuff like Blackbeard, like Ace is after Blackbeard, and that's why he's here. And and um, Blackbeard is a big part of of what happened to um, one of these towns. I think it was I think it was Vivi's town. Uh, the fact that there are multiple mentions of the Will of D in this saga. So like these little things, these little foreshadowing things. I, I just want to assure you guys I'm seeing them and as I'm doing these chats over on my Patreon, I'm discussing them uh, as we're doing these these discussions. I'm just, they're not all making it into the videos because these videos are really long and I'm just trying to hit on the really impactful moments. So you can still, you can still, you can still talk about them in the comments, of course, to just to make sure I caught them. But just to reassure you, if I'm not mentioning something, it's not necessarily because I missed it, just there's a lot to cover. <laughs> And these videos are so long already. Okay, now let's talk about Arabasta. You guys, this arc is genius. Their, their symbol of their fellowship, their them thinking ahead after they meet Bon Clay and see, okay, we're after, the, there's a lot more going on here than we can really anticipate. We could be impersonated. We need to know that we can trust each other. So they think of the symbol and then they think of a symbol beyond the symbol to protect them even farther. I love this crew. I love these moments. I love the bond that they've developed with Vivi and with, um, what's the duck's name? Why can't I think of the duck's name? I'll remember it eventually. <laughs> or I won't, cause I'm me. I. I love this crew. Um, I obviously loved seeing Smoker again, seeing Ace again, and their whole interaction and the chaos of of Luffy coming barreling through a wall right into the hands of the man that's looking for him and Ace and Luffy, you know, Ace defending them. I just, oh, it was all brilliant. However, now let's get into like the actual plot of the story. I enjoy watching them go through the desert so much, uh, partially because I just really enjoy desert stories. I don't know why, but just just the, the, the humanity of going through a desert, the reality of having to portion water and food and, you know, seeing visions and uh, hallucinating, and which is the same thing. I just said the same thing twice. All the different things that come up with crossing the desert, just the despair, the hope hopelessness, the how will we ever get across it? I don't know. It fascinates me. And seeing this crew do it is just lovely. I really like how similar Luffy and Usopp react to things, whether it be a beam, a, a, a ray beam that's very powerful, whether it be uh, just something else very impressive that they salivate over, or whether it be something like, we're tired, we're thirsty, we're not happy anymore. And just the way they react versus the way the rest of the crew reacts. I just see so much friendship and camaraderie between these two because their personalities are so different yet so the same. And I think it's delightful. I love when Luffy realizes that uh, their plan isn't the right plan, that really they need to get to the root of the problem and they need to go kick crocodiles butt. And then I also love right after that, seeing the king, seeing that he truly is a good king, that he truly, he's like Vivi. He's just after protecting his people and giving, providing them with safety and care. Um, and I love that the king comes to that exact same conclusion of, we got to get to the root of the problem. We need to address crocodile. Um, okay. Okay. Only the heavy moments, only the biggest moments. They're all captured now. They fell into the trap and now they're captured by Crocodile. They're in this cage. The sea stones make it so that they can't get out. Vivi shows up. Vivi, who is powerless, who is wholly human, goes one-on-one -on -one against a warlord of the sea, the man who has destroyed her entire world. The man who captured people far stronger than her, the ruthless villain who unflinchingly is bad. She cannot win, but she will fight. And that 
pluck, that tenacity in Vivi throughout this entire arc is one of the biggest things that endears me to her. Her willingness to always fight and to always, well, Luffy put it best when he was fighting Crocodile. She will die. <laughs> she will die for these people. She will fight until she can't fight anymore. She will give everything for her kingdom to protect her people. And I just think that that is so inspiring. Vivi is such an inspiring character. Uh, but then also I really, really love the role that Sanji plays in this, being Mr. Prince and coming in and fighting the crocodiles and saving them. I just love the role that Sanji plays with this like superhero persona. Put the glasses on, he's Mr. Prince. Take them off, he's Sanji. It's brilliant. Um, you know, coming in and saving the crew, forcing Mr. Three to uh, make a key, uh, not for the last time, to get everybody out. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful time. I loved that Zoro saved Smoker, not by his own choice. In fact, he would happily have let Smoker die, but his captain told him to, so he did. And now Smoker is gonna let them go free in this moment. And I, there's so many things that happen in this saga between Smoker and them and between Sword Girl and them that just has me so curious about what's going to happen moving forward. There's so much mutual respect there and so much humanity in Smoker. I'm really, really curious what their relationships are going to be like. But her choosing to fight with them, Smoker choosing to let them go, there's so many things that happen in this that just make me wonder what kind of relationship they're going to have moving forward, and I'm really, really excited to see it. Oh, I also love the role that Chopper played in all this while everybody's being captured and all this chaos is happening, Chopper being the decoy and then just rushing in to save the day on a giant crab because of course he did is amazing. I love the crew's absolute love for Vivi and how much they fight for her and care for her. When when Crocodile is capturing Vivi and then Luffy knocks her back and takes that capture for himself to fight off against Croc, um, I love that, uh, that scene when Sanji tells Vivi, you're not fighting on your own anymore. <sighs> I can't put into words, you guys. I can't put into words how much I love this arc, how much I love this saga. The way they wholeheartedly throw themselves into her mission. All three of Luffy's fights with Crocodile were incredible and I've kind of already covered it. Um, not only were they so great to watch, but the fact that Luffy really is overpowered, that he is defeated twice before he's finally able to defeat Croc. And the only reason he's actually able to defeat him is because Crocodile underestimates him. He should have died for all intents and purposes, but he doesn't. <laughs> and and they were all so intense um, and so wonderful to watch, but also just, you know, seeing Luffy so absolutely outmatched, but not giving up. The kind of speeches that he delivers, you know, that Crocodile just genuinely doesn't get it. Vivi will die if she fights this fight alone, so I'm not gonna let her. And then Crocodile's like, you're gonna die too. And Luffy says, if I die, I die. Luffy's fights with Crocodile and the genuine reality of he's not strong enough this time. But then thinking, thinking through it, you know, fighting with blood, being able to hit him, being able to understand the water thing and then using his blood to be able to hit him. And, and the speeches he delivers, the climax of the fight, when Crocodile's finally defeated and rain starts falling, you guys, you guys, that's like cinematic brilliance. Do you know what I mean? Like the fight's over and the rain starts to fall and then the people can hear Vivi screaming. Like, I don't even, it's so good. It's so ridiculously good. I love that Smoker trusts Sword Girl to just trust her instincts and make her own decisions and that she gets to be a part of, of actually 
making them succeed because she chooses to trust the straw hats. I love, I love the spotlight on her because I adore her character. Is it Tashiki? What is her name? I love the role she plays. I love how she trusts her instincts and her instincts tell her to trust the crew. Robin was incredible in this arc from being Crocodile's assistant, being ruthless, all that she ju does just to understand that hundred year gap in history, just to be able to get to one of the, what are they called? Pond graph, just to be able to get to one of the pond graphs. And then she lies to Crocodile when they get there because she didn't care about him. She just wants to understand history. We get a little bit of information about the hundred year gap, a little bit of information about the pond graphs. I love, like this is years, you know? Like this is years in advance of when we're finally going to be in Ennis Lobby, I think, as far as like the week-to-week -week publications go. And and just like this early on, we get a taste of it. We get a glimpse of it. We get to see something that we're going to be expanding on hugely later on. And that is actually a massive detail in the series. As far as I can tell, I think it's going to be a really big deal. I know it's a big deal to Robin. And I, I love, I love the foresight of Oda when he's making the series that he, something huge that'll come up later, he's just going to throw it in there blatantly, but not really explain it to us yet. And then explain on it so far down the road and it's such a satisfying expansion and 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 this little seed that he plants here oh it's just all over the series it's just all over the series that that these huge huge things are mentioned way back here and everything's so intentional I just I just oh my gosh rereading this saga has just I didn't need a reinvigoration of my love for the series, but it's given it to me anyway. Okay, I'm gonna end this, I guess, by talking about two people. Vivi, I guess I'll start there. Um, Vivi, I've already talked about her a lot, about her tenacity, about her, her absolute um, rejection of even the concept of giving up, that, that everything Everything is based on her love for her people and her desperate, desperate need to protect them, to end the war because she doesn't want her own people to be killing each other. She doesn't want any blood to be shed. Um, her fighting tooth and nail, this human in a war set forth by a warlord that she would sacrifice so much, that she would put so much of herself into, um, into doing anything she can, you know, to... To protect them. This scene when when Crocodile is defeated and the rain starts to fall and the entire crew is celebrating because Luffy won, their captain won, but Vivi is just still desperately screaming for them to stop fighting because there's still bloodshed. It's not a victory until her people put down their swords and stop harming each other. When Pell comes in and takes the bomb, which I mean, there are a lot of fake-out deaths in this saga. There are five fake-out deaths in this saga. That's a lot. That, that's five separate characters. My golly. But, and Pels is kind of hard to reconcile, truthfully. It's, it's a tough one to reconcile. His sacrifice, what he says to her before he takes the bomb, it's been an honor to serve you. The little flashbacks that we got to see of how much he's loved her and protected her over the years, how loyal he's been to the family, and then he takes the bomb and he flies it away. It's such a good moment. Karu is the duck's name. Karu, uh, first of all, Vivi not taking Bonclay's bait because they had so much foresight on on their the symbol of their fellowship, so she sees that that's not really Usopp. Karu, um, when when Vivi is is standing trying to stop the fight, and they just blow right past her. Her childhood friend just blows right past her. And then Karu takes the damage. He's, he takes the impact for her. And then he climbs up that mountain and flies like, oh my goodness, Karu is a great player in this entire war. And this, oh, I love Karu. I have to leave in five minutes. Can I do it? I, there were so many great fights with the crew in the midst of all of this. Um, Usopp playing uh, uh, whack-a-mole. <laughs> um, his, his ability, again, to outthink his enemies, um, his, his tenacity, his fight, his, his 
bravery despite being afraid. Uh, the whole fight between Sanji and uh, Bancle is wonderful. Um, I love seeing them fight against each other, this mutual respect and understanding that they have for each other, and then Sanji at the end of the fight extending a hand and, and telling him it was a good fight. That's a brilliant moment. Nami and her fight, while it was silly and funny and the poor girl was being laughed at and pitied by her own enemy because Usopp, who barely had time to create the, the weather stick staff thing, he barely had time to create it, but he did have time to make a list of gags for it. Poor freaking Nami, but she figured it out and she had such a great moment being able to finally overcome uh, who she was fighting, I don't know the chick's name, and uh, oh, what was that thing that she said? It doesn't hurt a bit. Do you have any idea the pain Vivi has su have suffered compared to that, a foot or two or three? Man, Nami's amazing. Zoro, who fights off against somebody who is steel and he, he views it as uh, a good thing as something to thank the guy over because uh, because now that he's fought him that means or once he defeats him that means that he'll have learned how to cut through steel and then he thanks him at the end of it because he, he learned it I mean taking on damage that should have killed him <sighs> amazing I love the king carrying Luffy out on his back at the end, I love the crew saying, no, no, you go ahead. You got to speak to your people. And then as soon as Vivi and King Cobra are out of eyesight, they both just fall over. Exhausted. Absolutely exhausted. <sighs> the point where Smoker and Tashigi um, meet back up and, and she's crying because she couldn't defeat Crocodile because she teamed up with pirates. Smoker's just there for her and then he gets the call and the world government is going to try to spin this to make them look the best they can. Um, and Smoker tells them, tell them to shove off. And I guess, okay, I'll end on Vivi, but I'm just going to mention this character here because this character, whose name I don't know, uh, is one of my favorite characters in One Piece, I think. He is the face of the people of Vivi's kingdom. His absolute trust in the king, that he he knows that the king didn't betray him. His, his years and years and years of just with a smile on his face, with, with joy in his heart, just continuing to dig because he believes in, in this kingdom, because he believes in this land, because he knows that it's not done with him yet. His determination to keep going despite the hopelessness around him and the kindness and love that he showed. And then this panel at the end where he puts his shovel down and smiles into the rain and says, just three years, that's all it took. Whew. This guy, man, he speaks to me. He, Oda writes really good little characters. Them blatantly har harboring pirates and challenging when they're like, you have pirates here. And they're like, what's your proof? Brilliant. Oh yeah, I still need to address Bon Clay. Oh no. Bon Clay is a character that I really haven't changed my thoughts on. Uh, in Impel Down, he was someone that I don't really like. He's impersonating people. He's making me hope that Zoro was here, but he's not here. Uh, but he won me over. He's hilarious. He's in the midst of chaos, he's just like, this is crazy, I'm just gonna twirl. Uh, he's he's funny, he's silly, he, uh, he is loyal, and the sacrifice that he made for Luffy in the end is, I mean, I didn't like him at first, he started to wear me down, and then at the end was when, uh, you know, his sacrifice, and I was like, okay, I, I have respect for this character. I don't love him, but I have a lot of respect for him. And now, re-seeing his beginning, I kind of feel the same way. In the beginning, I don't really care for him, but his comedic, goofy silliness endears me to him. And at the end of this arc as well, he, in the name of friendship, in the name of just having a level of love and respect for friendship on par with what Luffy has, he sacrifices himself for the crew, knowingly puts himself in impel down for them to give them the chance to go get a friend. And that's awesome. He, I mean, his arc in this and his arc in Impel Down is really similar. He's a character that I don't love on the level that everybody seems to really, really want me to, but I do, I do have a lot of respect for and I do like a good amount. And finally, I'm gonna be late, but I, I'll end it here. 
Finally, Vivi's speech and her call to the crew. I hope you'll accept me as one of you if we ever get to meet again in the future, which I just, I have hope that you will. Um, them not being able to respond because they don't want to put her in a position where it's clear that she's allied herself with pirates. So they raise their fists, they show the X. Oh, you guys, it's such a powerful ending. It's such a powerful saga. Vivi's fight for her people and our crew's fight for their person. It's such a display of what One Piece can be on the levels of emotion and sacrifice and on deep themes being explored honestly, rawly, and unflinchingly. And it's such a great display of who this crew is. I loved this saga so much on reread. I enjoyed it the first time around, but on a reread, man, it hits so hard. I can't, I can't properly put into words how incredibly I think that this was written and how much I enjoyed being here again. I'm gonna be late, I gotta go. Thanks for hanging out with me. Check out my Patreon if you want to. We discuss things really in detail over there and we have a wonderful time. Be sure to chat with me more in the comments. Thanks for hanging out with me if you made it this far. I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon, bye.